59, 58, 57. I'm going to have to hurry it up if I'm going to get through this in one minute. Thanks. I'm really blessed. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it. Good news is, is the Lord says, one day is, is a thousand days in the Lord's time. So you guys are going to be here a long time. That's how that goes. I want to introduce myself. I'm Steve Swanson. I'm the teaching pastor at Faith in Christ Fellowship. I'm on loan to Lighthouse uh, for a short period as you go through this transition and seeking a new senior pastor. And what a blessing it is to serve on that team. It, it's just the best to be able to be a part of what you're building and where you're going. We've been friends with Lighthouse for over 30 years, and we're just blessed to be with you all again. Uh, my wife, Kathy, sends her greetings to you all. Uh, she couldn't be here today. She's back ministering at our home church, so she's busy, busy, busy doing what she's doing. Um, and I'm really blessed for her in my life as well. So I'm going to let's get right at it since I only have a little bit of time left. How many theologians do we have in the house? Wow. All right, now wait a minute. Theology, theo means God. Logos means knowledge. So a theologian is one who is studying or learning about God. Now how many theologians do we have? Come on. All right, because there's no such thing as a Christian who is not a theologian. You cannot be a Christian and not be a theologian, right? It's just how it is. Isn't that good? All right, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm a te- I'm really am a teaching pastor. I don't I not do a lot of rah-rah stuff, but I, I like the word, and I like what it's done in my life, and I know in all of your lives, your own testimony as well. But I want to start today by reviewing just a little bit of last week's powerful sermon. If you haven't seen it, Go online, it's on our website at Lighthouse. Pastor Evelyn did a sermon called The Art of War. Wasn't that terrific? Yeah, let's give God, that that was just amazing. I listened to it, I listened to it. Now, she took great pains to point out that we are at war. We are at this minute in war. We have been in war since the beginning of time. And there's a real threat from a real Satan who wants to rob you of your testimony, destroy your ministry, wreck your family, to take everything away from you. That's his job. But I want to say we're going right forward with this. If you're not sensing this war, perhaps you're not at the front. Okay? Now, I say this without apology. The worst place for a Christian to be is comfortable. Now, if you're all comfortable, you're missing the war. And it's going to come to you anyway. Because I'll tell you what. Why is this so important? Listen, we don't have time. We just don't have time. I have neighbors who are going to hell if I don't get them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, how many of you have prodigals in your family who haven't come home yet? They'll go to hell unless I'm there in the, giving the word of God to them. They need me to be engaged in this, and that's what Pastor Evelyn was talking about last week. It's, we re-engage into the fight that God's called us to fight. And she talked about the armor of God as the necessity of being in this war, that we have to have these parts. And she also talked about guarding our hearts. Do you remember that? And she also talked about taking thoughts captive to Christ as part of this war. Well, how do I do that? Take a thought captive. You know, not every thought that comes into your mind has a right to be there. That's what we think. We're, we're, we're like, oh, I have a thought. I need to process it. No, you don't. You are the one that runs your mind. 
So let me, there's a real clear and easy way to do that. If you, if you happen to have a Bible or, or you're taking notes, jot this verse down, Philippians 4, 8. If you don't have this verse, write it down, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your mirror in the morning. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, let your mind dwell on these things. Those are the eight things that can be in your mind. If they don't match that list, you kick it out. You take that thought captive to Christ. It's pretty, pretty simple to do. Now, when it says that that word dwell is, is a uh, Greek word, and it means it's actually where the source of logic, the word logic comes from when you dwell. So what it's really saying is not only dwell on it, this literally becomes your worldview. That's what it's saying. So in practical, what does that mean today? Well, here's what it means to me. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a conservative. I'm not a liberal. I'm a Christian. And what that means is I have a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. If it's not, if there's something going on that's not in this word, then that's not going to be in my life. Every single word of it. Every single word. Now, the thing about this Bible is you can accept it, you can reject it, but you can't change it. Now, as soon as you change one part of this Bible... It's no longer the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it's the gospel of Steve Swanson. You know what that makes? You know what the outcome of that is? That makes me responsible for my own salvation. I can't even keep my desk clean. How am I going to keep my heart clean? I mean, I've got to have this. It's the, it's the rock on everything I do. Every, every news article, every everything is processed through this before it gets in here and finally makes the journey down to here where my heart is. And that's how I do it, and it's good for us to do. Amen? And then Pastor Evelyn also talked a, a, quite a bit last week about um, accessing the power of God, and that's where I am today. That's kind of a long intro, but I still have 59 seconds left. <laughs> See, I'm the one holding the clock, so there, that's a bit of a problem. All right, so the verses, if you want to open up your Bibles or turn on your Bibles or access your Bibles or however you get a hold of yours, I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 3, Verses 14. Now, these verses that we're going to read, these are hinge verses in the book of Ephesians. There's a first half of the book talks about what God has done and the victory that God has wrought on the world because of his work through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the first half of the book. It also, the first half of the book, talks about the new thing that he's done of birthing the church which is a monument to the victory that Jesus Christ did. The church that we're sitting in today, the church that we belong to, is a monument to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Hallelujah. That's such good news. And so the second half of this book is how to live in that new reality. Because now we have a new king, Jesus Christ. We have a new church, how do we live in that new reality? We have new powers. And, 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 and power is part of that process that we go by. And I'll tell you what. You have to give your beliefs a job. You have to have faith needs to have a purpose or it withers away. And that's what the power of God brings into your heart. So we're going to read, uh, just go ahead and read. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21. Ready? All right. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Lord, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. 
that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, here it comes, to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. That's Ephesians 3.16. Now, if you want, this is a teacher part of me. If you want to have a really good Bible study, go through all of the 3.16s that are in the New Testament. Oh, I'm telling you, it'll blow your mind. I, and that was, pure, I mean, it wasn't even meant to be that way. Just because these, these verses weren't added till 1300s. The awesome study. Anyway. Where, where, okay, here we go. Sometimes I take rabbit trails. <laughs> the problem is I never catch the rabbit. That, that, that's the bad part. All right, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Now, there's the source of power is Christ's love. I'm telling you, there's no power without the love of God. That's the source of it, and that changes it from being brute power to overcoming power. Not sledgehammer power or breaking power, but healing power, gracious power. Oh, this is so good. And that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God. Do you know why you're filled up? So that you can be empty. Have you ever been driving around out in the farmland out there and you see a silo sitting there? So what's the purpose of a silo? It's got to be full of corn, but it can't stay full of corn, can it? It has to be empty. And then next fall, filled, emptied, filled, empty, filled. That's what the Christian normal life is all about. And that, that thing that's being filled is love. It's your love tank being topped off every single time. And then it goes on to say, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. 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 You know, uh, amen is, I'm going to take another side note here. You know the word amen, when, you know why you say amen? I agree part of it, but it, it also means to prophesy it into. When I say the amen to a situation, I'm prophesying God's power into that situation. It's more than just an agreement. It's a, it's a, it's a loosing of the power of God into that. That's why in the book of John, you'll see the, the word amen in Greek is translated truly into English. So if you go into the book of John, every time John writes it, he puts truly, truly. And then he goes on to say something. Amen, amen. He wants to make doubly sure it's been prophesied into whatever that situation is. So remember, the next time you say amen, you're saying, Lord, that's going to become a reality. That's the new reality. And then put it in your heart and believe it. Give your faith a job. Put it in there to do that. Now, what am I, so what does this mean for us as Christians? Well, one of my favorite Characters of all times is Snoopy. You all know Snoopy? Yeah. Well, I've, one of my favorite cartoons of all times, right, right there. That's the Christian right there. I'm full of potential. <laughs> so that's the title of today's sermon. I'm full of potential. Now he's got another one later on. There's no heavier burden than a great potential. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. I love that stuff. So now, the, the thing is, how do I go from potential to powerful? How do I move from getting off the top of the doghouse and, and getting into the dog fight itself? You see? All right. 
So what, let's just take a step back. What does biblical power even mean? Well, it's a Greek word, and most of the time it's trans. There's about four different words, but the most one we connect with is the dunamis word, where we get the word dynamo, like a generator. And the word dynamic all come from that word itself. Now, it's most frequently used in the New Testament as a, as a way of talking about supernatural events, supernatural healings, supernatural raising of the dead, supernatural parting of the waters. Those things, that's the power, the dunamis part of it. But it goes a lot further than that. It also it stresses into there the, the power to raise. It's also the, and here's the key part, it, it's not only the power to raise the dead, but here's the even harder one. The power to love your enemy. That's true. I'm telling you, that takes a stretch. That's going to take some serious power to do that. Serious power. It's the same power, dunamis, that you need to keep your marriage vows. You're going to need that. Acts 1.8, power is a promise, power is a promise, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Who's the you in there? Yeah, that's you. So that's what I'm saying. You, if you're a Christian, that power is in you. And so I always want to make sure I remember this because it, power must never be separated from promise. And promise must never be separated from power. Now, let's take, let's take for example, wedding vows. Isn't that a promise? Okay. I've been doing marriage counseling for over 30 years. I love marriage. I love being married. I love every single thing about it. But in all the marriage counseling I do, troubled couples have one thing in common. Every single couple I've ever counseled has had this as an issue. I'll ask them, what were the vows you made to each other? None of them can remember. Now, how are you going to keep a promise if you can't remember it? You see what I'm saying? That's why in my bedroom is my vows I made to my wife right on the wall. It's the first thing I see every single morning. On my desk at work, my vows sit right next to me, right there. Because if I can't keep that promise, I won't probably keep any other promise. And my, wife, my Lord says to me, you have to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's going to take some serious power. See? So this is, this is how my wife and I get through marriage. We play a game. You're going to like this. No charge for this. This is totally free. You're going to love this. We, we play a game every single day. And this is what's making our marriage work. Now, what would you think if I gave you a game you could play that would guarantee your marriage would work? I don't see a single hand going amen. I didn't, I didn't see anybody. What's the matter with you? You're afraid of what I'm going to say, aren't you? You're afraid of where this game is going. Well, actually, it's not that bad. And it's super easy. Here's a game we play. Every day, the game for Kathy and I is to outlove the other one. Every single day. Oh, it's a great game. This is a win-win. Even when you lose, you win. And so if I lose the bet, I still get outloved. You see what I mean? The good news is if you forget to play it for a couple days, you can pick it up later on and it still works. It's the greatest thing. But you need power to be able to do that. 
You've got to have the power of God to be able to do that. Amen? <laughs> so you got 57 seconds left. <laughs> All right. So the thing is, the religion of the Lord, God's religion, I know everybody hates that word, but it's a true reality. The religion of the, of the Lord is not wrapped up in words, in a word. Not in eloquence or excellence of speech or any of those things, but in power, the mighty energy of the Holy Spirit at work in us. That's the true religion of God. Demonstrating and manifesting the power of God is the nature of the Christian life. Just that. Now, how do I, let me break that off for you. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those that believe the world can be divided into two kinds of people and those that don't. <laughs> I'm of the latter. But I do think there are levels of reality for different people. And so I have these four levels, four levels of the power of God at work in you. Level one, I am moving in the power of God. Level two, I'm not moving in the power of God. Level three, I don't know what the power of God is. And number four, level four is, I don't care if I move. Now, if you're in number four, you might as well pack up all you have and go to the Cracker Barrel and have breakfast because you're not going to like the rest of what I have to say. Because if you don't care, you're on your own. Now, if you don't know, if you don't know what the power of God is, remember this, all Christians, remember this. Pentecost is our default. That's the default character for a Christian. Go read Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's a normal Christian life. And if you want to dig into it a little bit more, I suggest you get this book, Watchman Knees, A Normal Christian Life. It's a great read. And in here, you'll be surprised at what a normal Christian life is. But it's full of power. It's full of manifesting the Word of God. It's full of all of that. All right. So, how else can I know if I move in God? Let me ask you this. How many of you pray that Satan will know your name? You sure? Hmm. Let's go back into Acts 19. This is Paul in the book of Acts while he was in Ephesus, by the way. This same thing. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were being carried away from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. There's the power of God. Amen? But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempting to name over those who had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this as well. And then the evil spirit answered them and said, You know, I recognize Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And then it says, the evil spirits pounced on the guy, ripped him up, threw him out naked. I'd much rather have him know my name. And I'm saying, if you are moving in the power of Jesus Christ, trust me, he knows your name. He makes sure he steers clear because I don't care what anybody tells you, he's powerful, but God's all-powerful. Yes. Satan's mighty, but God's almighty. You see what I'm saying? And where does he live? Right here. It's good if Satan knows your name. Another way to know, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit to the common good. How many of us? Every single one. 
Each one. And then it goes on to list them. For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, another faith by the same Spirit, and another gift of healing by one Spirit, and another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues, and to another various interpretations of tongues. That's a list of some super powerful stuff. I want to be doing those. Through your life, through your Christian life, these will manifest themselves over and over again. For me, the word of knowledge, words of knowledge, have come through my entire Christian life. Not every minute or every day, but they happen. And some of them have been extremely powerful and greatly unnerving. I was in a Christian bookstore one time, looking through books, spending more money than I should. And there was a guy standing next to me, and I felt the Lord say to me, I want you to go and tell him that his mother, your mother-in-law needs to move out of your house. That's what the Lord said to me. I promise you this is true. Now, if I would have been new in this gifting, I, I, I'd, have, I'd have had to take a day off and think that one through. But, <laughs> but I'd seen God work before, and so I, I just, look, if I end up being a fool for Christ, that's still okay. You know what I mean? If I blow it, I'm, oh, it's okay if I'm a fool for Christ. It doesn't matter. So I went up to this guy, and I said, I know you, this is going to sound really, really strange. But I felt the Lord telling you that your mother-in-law needs to move out of the house. Does that mean anything to you? And the guy sat down right where he was. Tears coming out of his eyes. He said, my mother-in-law came from India and is living in our house. And in the Indian culture, the mother runs the house. And it's creating great tension between my mother, her mother and the daughter. You see, I've been asking God and asking God what to do. So off he went. I gave him my number. He said he was going to call me back. And sure enough, about a week later, he called back and said, you're never going to believe this. I went home and I said to the mother-in-law, you need to move out. She says, I've been waiting for you to tell me that since I got here. You see what I'm saying? The strangest things you can possibly imagine are normal in Christ. This is all absolutely normal. All right, let's take a minute real quick. What stops us from moving in power? Fear. Oh. Awesome. Do you, do you have my notes? I think, I think that sometimes we as Christians are tethered to our inadequacies. We're tied up in them. We're all caught up and we can't get out of it. We have to stop doing that. We've got to stop cataloging our shortcomings. Stop making lists of things that are wrong in my life. Start making, start making lists of promises of God. That's where you're going to get the power from. Instead of listing problems, list provisions. And you, get, you wait till you see that list. Philippians 4, 13. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The things that are impossible for you are possible for God. That's the way it goes. In the world, seeing is believing. In the kingdom of God, believing is seeing. Dude, it, it went... You've got to start seeing the invisible if you want to start manifesting the impossible. Amen? That's what we have to do. I'm trying to make sure I don't miss anything. Do you know that these promises of God are the foundation of a life of a Christian? John 10.10, 10, say, I came that you might have 
life and have it abundantly. Now, th that word in the Greek, that abundant, is like super abundant, not like just barely filled up. There's two words for life in the Greek. Bios, where we get biology, which means life that exists, life that is. Then there's another word, zoe. Now that zoe means life that's effervescent. It's like water bubbling out of you. It's the, it's the life that, that makes people wonder where you're coming from. That's what we want to live in, zoe life. Zoe life. Get out of the bios, get into the zoe. See? That's what we can do. And what robs you of that? Fear. The, I felt these three, these three things are robbing us. Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of change. Fear of being rejected. Fear of trying. I know. I can see that when they said one minute evangelism. It's coming up. Did you notice how quiet it got in here when you hear that word evangelism? Uh-oh. I'm going to have to start talking about God. Whoa. That's the fear speaking to you. <laughs> That's the fear. You know, the, the problem with fear is, by itself, fear wants you to remain hidden. That does. Now, there's a passage in the Bible that shows that. In Genesis 3, after Adam had sinned, he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Satan taught us how to sin. Sin taught us how to fear. Fear taught us how to hide. And we remain hidden. Now, there's a better way to be hidden. In Christ. Hidden in Christ. So they can't see Steve anymore. All they can see is Christ. That's a good way to be. Now, fear by itself doesn't have a voice, right? When you're fearful, you don't speak out, do you? No. You know what you do instead? You know what the voice of fear is? Legalism. So when you're afraid, you become legalistic to protect the position that you're in. It's shielding us, this legalism, from fear. So legalism is the voice that keeps the fears from being revealed. Problem with legalism, legalism will back you up on the wrong things. It will affirm you negatively. Not God's way. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> All right, the next one, second one, discouragement. Robbing of courage. That's what discouragement means. Someone robbed your courage. Now, so that's why I say encouragement is not um, um, patronizing or even complimenting. What encouragement actually is, is to give someone their heart back. That's what encouragement does. Encouragement replaces stolen hearts and lets your heart be revealed. Encouragement is more about unlocking the future in someone than anything else. Now, <laughs> I have to say, it's difficult to unlock the future if you're arguing with your past. That's just not going to work. You got to stop arguing with your yesterday and get on with it. Somewhere in your life, you have to get past the past. You just have to. Stop letting one chapter Define the whole book. But remain. It says stimulate one another. Encourage one another to love and good deeds. And finally the third one is complacency. Third one. That means you're satisfied 
with the status quo or comfortable. And did we talk about that already? So we need to replace fear with faith, discouragement with encouragement, and complacency with perseverance and get on with our Christian life. I'm going to move, I'm going to, I'm going to actually move right to the end. I'd like to move to close right now. I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap this up. I'd like to take what we've been doing, hearing, and turn it into experiencing. Amen. Here's, here's what I'm after. So we're going to take these few minutes from now and all that we've talked about. And I'm going to ask you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. What area of your life are you not moving in power? What area in your life would you like to see the Holy Spirit move you? Maybe it's in the area of gifting that we talked about. Words of knowledge, speaking in tongues, something like that. Maybe it's the power to make your marriage vows alive. Maybe it's the power to overcome unforgiveness. But what I'm saying is we need you know the new electric cars all have these plug-in things, right? And what happens if you don't plug that in? It's not going to get charged. So that's one of the reasons we come here today. There's no reason in the world to not leave here empowered. So we're going to ask I'm going to ask the elders if you wouldn't mind coming down here and some of the prayer team come down here. Just come on down and let here's what I'd like to do just for a few minutes as we pray about this. I'm going to ask you, is there an area in your life that you would like to see the power of God move? Is there something you'd like to ask the Lord to empower you to do? Somewhere, maybe you've felt that you've been complacent or maybe you've been fearful. Lord, give me the power to overcome my fears. Lord, I need help with this. And don't leave here. Don't leave here the way you came in. If God saves you and leaves you exactly where you are, what has he saved you from? There's somewhere I need to move in the power of God. And if you'd like, if you'd like to experience that or be, be prayed for for that, why don't we come down? Just take a minute, stroll on down, ask the Lord to fill you. Or maybe you just need a recharge. Now, I can tell automatically you've gone right back into fear mode again. (laughs) I don't want to be the only one. Why don't we just all stand? That'll get you out of where you are. Anyway, where you were comfortable. Remember when you were comfortable a minute ago? It's good to be Holy Spirit uncomfortable. You know, people got healed when the waters were troubled. Calm water wasn't where the healing was. It, the troubled water of the Holy Spirit is where the healing takes place. If you need to get prayed for, come on down here and do that. Just come on down. Yeah, any of you, any, anyone have anything to add to this? I'm just going to let them minister. All those who want to come up and get prayed for. What I'm going to do, I'm going to ask the rest of you, I'm going to pray a blessing over you and release you. If you're going to be, if you're going to stay, could you stay quiet so we can do some work up here? Would that be all right? All right, let me, and then I'll release the rest of you right now. May the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.